Um, we're going to go to mobile finishing school in 17 minutes. Um, I guess first off, I should say a quick word about um, Curious Office and what we do, what, what I do, uh, why uh, I do what I do, and why I'm standing on stage. Um, it's easier to say why I do what I do than it is to uh, justify being up here because there's a lot of amazing speakers. But basically, we invest in companies and we build companies. Um, that's kind of the short answer. This is some of them, uh, maybe some names you recognize. Um, but I suppose probably the reason that I'm standing here now is to talk to you uh, about mobile. Now, I am by no means a mobile expert, but I did make a mobile app, one for the iPhone and one coming out next week for the Android. Um, and it turned out that a lot of people liked it and a lot of people downloaded it and Apple liked it and they called it a staff favorite. Um, and we were downloading about 10,000 of these things a day, which make you let, uh, which basically help you make instant websites um, from your phone for just about anything, as many as you want for free. Um, so we wound up raising uh, recently about three and a half million dollars uh, for this venture to see if we could sort of take it to the next level. And what I want to share with you today is what I learned from this process. So why you should care about mobile. Um, mobile is kind of where it's at. Mobile is where everything's going. Mobile is basically the tailwind. It's the trend. Mobile is where all the great jobs are. Mobile is cool. Mobile is how most people will effectively access web pages in the very near future. Here we are in September 2011. By 2013, more people will access websites from their smartphone than they will from their computer. That's pretty unbelievable. So I think that when you consider the constraints of mobile, it's really not just another customer channel. This possibly could be the most significant evolution in user interaction since the mouse. That's pretty remarkable. Um, so some bullet points about mobile and what I learned, and then I want to talk about sort of mistakes and lessons, mistakes and lessons pretty much through the rest of this presentation. Um, so basically, I learned to embrace constraints. Um, you don't have a big screen to work with. The screens are sort of fixed in size. There's a lot of things you can't do on mobile that you, that you can do on PCs and so forth. You guys all know that. It basically forced me to change the way I think, uh, just in terms of application design and, and how people actually use the applications. Their patience level is totally different. They go down into elevators and they lose their signal. All kinds of crazy things happen. Um, I learned that it's really, really important to get more technical as a designer. Um, I, design this app pretty much myself from, from sort of ground zero on up. So I kind of want to share you with that, uh, share what that's like. Um, you often don't lose uh, connectivity from your laptop when you're sitting at home. And it turns out that really impacts the user experience as you're making an app um, for a phone. And lastly, learn to prioritize because you figure out very quickly that you can't have everything uh, on your phone. So lessons and mistakes, here we go. Um, keep an eye on the clock here. How many people have seen this? How many people have read it top to bottom? <laughs> All right. This is one of your Bibles from here on out for the rest of your career. Not the only one, but it's an important one. Microsoft has one. Android has one. And it's really important to basically memorize this thing inside out and backwards. Um, this is called the HIG document, the Human Interfaces Guidelines document. Failure to understand what you're doing when you're designing for mobile really, really, really well, we'll screw up your project, we'll make it cost twice as much, and we'll slow it down, I promise you. So this is the most important thing that I can tell you. Um, you've all seen this screen here, I'm guessing. Probably a lot of people in this room have this app on your phone. Um, the reason that I have this up here is because you'll learn quickly with mobile that subtle things matter. Um, this thing down here on the bottom is called the tab bar. I don't know how many people knew that. Do you know what thing on top's called? called a nav bar, right? It's important, nav bar, tab bar. The reason I pulled this up is because any of you who spend time like I do, killing time on Dribbble or Forest or anything else, sort of looking at eye candy, design eye candy all day, you see a lot of fancy implementations of this kind of thing. In this particular case, there's sort of this raise thing right here. Now, what I want you to know about that is that there's no code you can go download to basically make a custom tab bar like that. Microsoft says, here's how the tab bar works. It's straight line all the way across. And if you want to do it differently, go fend for yourself. So I've done four different versions of a tab bar like, uh, tab bar like this, I mean, from a development standpoint. And I can tell you 
that if you know what you're doing, this is five hours of extra work. If you don't know what you're doing, this is seven days of extra work just to get that bump. I'm not joking. Try it. <laughs> you might also know this little pattern up there on top of the, uh, on top of the uh, nav bar. To get the pattern on top of the nav bar and to get the button sitting on top of the nav bar to inherit some subset opacity of that little stroke means you have to subclass all the buttons in the nav bar. So implications, so much more than you think. So this is basically all the stuff you have to learn. You have to learn about icons, resolutions, network bars, custom toolbars. We talked about that. You've got to learn about gestures, transitions, tap targets. How many people in here know what is the smallest recommended tap size that you should have for your iOS app? 44 by 44. Exactly. Is it a law or is it a rule? Recommendation. Exactly right. All right. So here's a mistake. Failure to edit your app down to the barest essentials and get to the essence of what it is that you're trying to build. With a website, we often don't think a lot about this kind of stuff um, because you just have so much more affordance to dump more stuff on the screen. You don't have that affordance with a mobile, uh, with a mobile app. The other thing is, you know, I, I chose this picture for a reason, right? This is how we use our phone. So imagine this guy coming down the escalator, going out of the basement to get on the subway, and he's trying to sort of schedule his next Airbnb thing. He's jumbled by lots of people. He's trying not to fall down the escalator. And sure enough, he's going to lose a signal as he goes down to the subway station, right? Well, that is the reality of mobile app usage. So you've got to get to the heart of what the app's all about, strip away everything else, and also remember that you're going to lose your signal sometimes. You're going to have a weak signal sometimes. The experience and how you manage that whole experience um, has to be very thoughtful. Um, the other thing that I've kind of learned is use sticks, use drawing in the dirt, use whatever your favorite wireframing tool is, but get as close to the actual app as humanly possible uh, before you start doing anything. Because you'll learn that doing, being simple, being simpler, is always, always, always harder. So just wireframe, 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 prototype, prototype, prototype. You guys have heard that here before. Um, fake the entire app as best you can. Show it to friends. Save yourself lots of headaches. If for no other reason but because iOS developers are hard to find and they're really expensive. 120 bucks an hour. Right? So there's no concept of clicking. Even scrolling isn't really a word we use anymore. So learn to embrace new terms. I can always spot a new mobile app designer when he says, oh yeah, I just put this button up here, and what you're supposed to do is click here. If I hear the word click, I know they probably haven't made a mobile app that's actually shipped before. Um, so the reason this stuff's important is because the gestures are important, because it enhances what your app's all about, but also because the way you use your phone is different than a computer. You're sort of juggling in one hand, and you're trying to like, you know, reach with your thumb while holding the phone without dropping it across the button and you're trying to do stuff. Um, so just the way you actually interact with the device and the way the app should work and behave, it's just very, very different than a computer. And the consequences for missteps, the consequences for mis, um, mistaps, as you know, so much more significant than it is with a computer. There's no back button and you're sort of back where you went. Sometimes, yes, but most of the time you get punished. All right, so gestures, learn them, know them intimately well, figure out how you can use them in your app wisely, avoid using them in your app foolishly. Um, there are certain cases where the gestures that mobile devices will support make tons of sense. And they're obvious, and they sort of fall in the bucket of why didn't I think of that, right? This is, I guess, a really good example. But there's a lot of really, really, really bad examples. So there are more bad examples than good examples. So be super, super thoughtful about this. All right, my favorite. Failure to understand the differences between iOS, Android, and Windows Mobile. It goes back to reading the HIG documents. Read those inside out, backwards, memorize them intimately well. Um, this is an email from a friend of mine who works at Amazon. His name is blocked out for a good reason. He's a business guy who has something to do with the Amazon Mobile store. <laughs> Um, and I said, look, I'm working on an Android uh, version of this, of this thing. You know, what devices do you recommend I support? Because as you guys probably know, or maybe you don't, there's just dozens and dozens of different screen resolutions and sizes and so on and so forth. And he sends me this list. I would recommend making sure your app works in the following devices. <laughs> OK. So, right. 
a business guy who's never made an app before, pretty obviously, right? But there's some seriousness in this joke because you're not going to make sure your app works on every one of these devices, are you? Where are you going to get every one of these devices, first off, right? Second off, there's so much variance in this list of devices that you quickly realize this just really, really doesn't make sense. How is that different from iOS, by the way? How many screen resolutions are there with iOS? Two. Exactly. So you will begin to think about your app in terms of screen size, screen density, orientation, resolution, and what all of those things basically mean and how it impacts how you actually make your app. That's really important because uh, when you make an app for the iOS, let's say, your buttons are basically exported at two sizes. But when you make it for Android, th there's all kinds of different heights and widths and pixel densities. And so you can't just make a button and like stretch it out horizontally and vertically arbitrarily because it's all fuzzy and weird and you're like not quite sure what happened. So keep that in mind. You will learn this phrase nine patch. Anybody here ever made a nine patch bitmap? So a nine patch bitmap basically is a graphic that traces itself in multiple directions so that if you get an Android screen, an Android phone with a horizontal resolution or an Android phone with a vertical resolution, it sort of traces itself across, up, down, or whatever, so that it always looks really crisp and clear. Um, don't ask a developer to help you make a nine patch <laughs> because they don't know what you're talking about. And that's really important to this whole conversation. There's a huge gap between what developers know and what designers know and what's necessary to ship a successful app in the iTunes store. A big black hole. That nine patch is one of many, many examples, and we can't, don't have time to talk about others. The developer doesn't know. Most of the time, the designer doesn't know. So take it upon yourself to learn this stuff. All right. Appreciate what the vendors have given you. Um, so the vendors, in this case, Apple, and I'm just going to focus on Apple because we have however many minutes left, not a lot. I've got to move really fast, so I will talk fast from here on out. Um, these on-off switches, you guys have all seen those, right? Okay. Custom artwork and mobile apps, recommended by Apple, recommended by Microsoft, recommended by Android, good idea. But think about what you're doing this custom and why. Up here there's an on-off switch done by an application which I won't name, but totally unnecessary. So pick and choose your battles, right? In the case of Apple, they were very, very thoughtful. They basically gave you this controller, a toggle element, that uses text, shape, and color to define what the toggle element's supposed to do. So the people who designed this app basically removed one of the three elements, in this case, color, and then somewhere down the road, they kind of figured out, like, oh, well, the on, off switch, the on switch looks like the on switch. Let's go ahead and then add a color back in so somebody noticed and they added this little green light back in. Totally ridiculous, right? So respect what they gave you and use the controls where they make sense. Use the components where they make sense. Um, on that note, thinking that components are like web page elements in that you can just freewheel and do whatever the heck you want with them. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people do that. So what's wrong with this picture? Right? Anybody remember what that's called, by the way? Nav bar. Right. So you can, by the way, put the nav bar at the bottom of an iOS app. It is allowed, and it will work. But you will look like an idiot. <laughs> so understand the differences in the controls that the vendors have provided you. So at this point, by the time you get to shipping your wildly successful app, you'll learn that the nav bar is for drilling down through hierarchical content, and the tab bar is basically for navigating through peer groups of content that aren't necessarily related to the other. Right? So super, super important. Know it inside out and backwards. And go ahead and start with one of these templates and learn what each one of these things is for. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them. You guys have seen all this stuff, right? All right, over design at your own risk. How am I doing on time? <laughs> um, that is really, really pretty. So I have five minutes and I've got to really go fast. This is super pretty, but pretty doesn't matter lots and lots and lots of times. Good artwork makes a big difference with an award-winning app, but you can really blow it. In this case, that's super pretty, but it's a really horrible experience for making a phone call. Um, here's another good example. This is an app that's actually shipping and it's real. And basically the idea is that you enter your weight on every given day and you save it, and then you can see how that compared to your weight on other days, and then you can see how it trended. This is what they gave you to do that. So when you got to the screen, it's not even clear what you're supposed to do, right? Not only that, but why would you go ahead and like come up with some new paradigm for scrolling up and down when there's already one of these things provided to you? So over here, it should look a lot more obvious as to what you're supposed to do, right? Lack of attention to detail, um, 
Don't have a lot of time to talk about that, but here's a good example. If there's two resolutions of, let's say, iPhones, and you don't make two different versions of buttons, and instead you just basically say, I'm going to make one version and let the phone like stretch it out to fit on the other, well, you know how that story ends. Um, Lack of attention to transitions um, and other animations, that's an important part of what mobile's all about. Learn where you should use HTML5 native and hybrid to go ahead and accomplish the animations in these transitions. Um, if you're not sure exactly what HTML5 is, and by the way, I'm really surprised that a lot of people use this phrase where they have no idea what it actually is. Um, if you don't know what Sench is, if you don't know what hybrid is, go ahead and dig in, just learn that stuff and figure out where it makes sense to um, be native versus not. Oh. Can't go backwards, by the way, when you have a PDF, so I'll just skip that. Uh, all right. Anyway, I know what slide that was before. So mobile apps are not basically the same thing as putting a website on your iPhone. Okay? The best apps are about removing things. So I don't know how many of you have ever noticed what in the Facebook app is on mobile, but what you can't access that you can't access on the website. It's a really interesting exercise. Go through it. It's, there's so much you can't get to on the mobile version. But you never thought about it, because what it does do, it does it really, really well. And you don't realize that you can't do 70% of all the stuff on Facebook that you can do on the mobile. But they pick the most important stuff. So that's really important. Um, all right, so this is a really big one. Fair to create a good workflow when, as you're making your iPhone app, especially if you're working with development. So basically what you want to do here is go ahead and set up a repository, do all your mockups for all the screens, put them in one place. Once you have finalized, taken everyone's comments, then you obviously want to have your, um, your one-time and your two-time PNGs, if it's for iOS, in a folder somewhere, punched out exactly right. Don't wait for the developers to do it for you, because they will mess it up. Um, and for Android, the exact same version of those buttons in another repository, which has all your nine patch graphics where necessary, and the bitmaps in another place. So use Dropbox, use whatever you need, but be super, super militant about it. Um, and it's not just about the app itself. Um, remember that as you're working on your app, it's basically about the splash screen. It's about the graphics that are necessary for the iTunes store. Um, it's about the app icon. Uh, by the way, I have a question for you. You notice that all app icons have rounded corners? So how do you think those rounded corners are accomplished? In Photoshop? No. So most designers will basically give you the app icon as they see it, because they see it and it's round. But it turns out that developers get the round one not knowing too, and they shove it into the system, and they basically compile it down, and it comes out and looks all really weird, and like a little corner of it gets cut off. And the reason is because the app icon should be provided to the developer's square. And it's, in fact, in code that they're trimmed. So those small little details. Other small little details. Um, Screen resolution of phones, I said know them intimately well. That's also not good enough. See that little thing at the top right there with the little, uh, the little network status bar indicator? So if that thing's there all the time, it must be chewing into your app by, what would you guess, 20 pixels? So the question then is, when is it there and when is it not? You have to learn that. <laughs> so. Um, Anyway, all the different assets that you need to go in all the stores that you want to basically publish in, super important. Um, and I think I'm super close to being done. That's me, and yeah.